And this is No Hate Radio. I'm no stranger to the rain. Oh, no. I'm no stranger to the rain. Welcome to No Hate Radio. We broadcast from St. Petersburg, Florida, on the Allendale Equity and Justice Channel. Thanks very much for listening to today's discussion. If you're tuning in for the first time, thanks again. And here at No Hate Radio, what we try to do and we seek to do is open and maintain thoughtful and constructive dialogue at the intersection of law, social justice, and public policy. Continually asking the questions, why and what are we going to do about it? We have had past discussions on everything from racism, anti-Semitism, LGBTQ issues, and more. Today's discussion is a continuation of a series around the issue of housing, which has involved discussions of local laws directed at unhoused persons and efforts to unwind or to seek to understand, at least, the complex issues uh, surrounding housing, unhoused persons, and the so-called issue of homelessness. Our guest today is Nick Carey. Nick, Nick is the lead organizer for an organization called Faith in Florida, uh, his particular area uh, of the state of Florida that he's responsible for as a lead organizer. Includes Orange County, uh, any, if anyone doesn't know, that's Orlando. Um, Pasco County, Hillsborough County, and Pinellas. Hillsborough and Pinellas are the, the Tampa-St. Petersburg area, if you're not familiar with that, because I know some of uh, folks have told me they listen from other parts of the country. Pasco County is a suburban county up north of uh, Tampa and St. Petersburg, so that's sort of, a, sort of an idea to get some geographic uh, connection with, uh, with where Nick does his work. And it's a, a statewide program. So I would ask at this time, uh, Nick, welcome to uh, No Hate Radio. I'm glad to have you here today. And would you uh, introduce yourself a little bit, and then we'll start talking about the issue that uh, we would like to put on the record today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, happy to be here. I love uh, the topic of the podcast being why and what are we going to do about it? Because that really kind of boils down to the role of, of organizing in our communities is figuring out why with people in our community and going out uh, to do something about it, to make, to make all of our lives uh, a little better. Um, as you said, I, I work for an organization called Faith in Florida. We are a faith-based group that works with different faith communities and impacted people and and we say that our mission is building beloved community and we believe the best way to do that is by addressing economic and social justice issues um, particularly pertaining to race and so the work that we do is really wrapped up in faith and wrapped up in community uh, and as we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about, really led to uh, the work around housing that I've done for the last several years. Thank you, Nick. And uh, I do want to talk about that. I know that your, your original scope, or maybe your continuing scope, is broader than housing and it certainly involves multiple other uh, social justice issues one of which being racism, but there's a lot of isms. There's, uh, we confront a lot of isms in our, our uh, experience and in our world. A lot of people get uh, uh, steeped in particular kinds of beliefs. One of the things that I would like to uh, delve into, I guess drill down on a little bit on housing here, is that uh, on No Hate Radio here, Cameron and I have learned in a, a couple of prior uh, discussions we've had with people that I think everyone seems to have a more simplistic understanding of, quote, the homelessness issue than really exists. By that, I mean uh, it's a very complex issue. It, it's wrapped up as we are now beginning to understand, and I don't claim to be that level of expert, but I'm beginning to understand that it's wrapped up in 
real estate economics in a particular area, particularly, let's say, St. Petersburg. It's wrapped up in, in uh, the public policy established by the governing bodies around these various communities. The notion that, that unhoused people are monolithic, that there is one kind of unhoused person. Uh, and I have actually heard the use of uh, the terms that applied in the 1920s and 30s around the railroad yards, the, the hobo, the tramp, and all that. This seems to steep into the definition, seems to be the way people want to look at uh, the issue. And like many, uh, at least I'm beginning at this point in my life to think that that uh, we all try to oversimplify a lot of very complicated issues. So I, I wonder if you might elaborate on how your organization has seen this develop and how you've uh, reacted to it or maybe tried to offer assistance to people. Yeah, I think the complexity that you mentioned really speaks to the systemic nature of the of the problem, you know, and just to give an example of the kind of different experiences that people have is I think it's a common perception that mental illness is one of the primary causes of homelessness or people being unhoused. And while that's definitely a comorbidity, it can be kind of a chicken or egg type situation of which comes first. Right. Exactly. <laughs> there are, there are plenty of folks who their mental health condition did lead to them being unhoused. And then there are plenty of folks with no history of mental illness who went through the traumatic experience of becoming unhoused and now are set up for a lifetime of mental health issues just because of the trauma of that. And um, but to, to circle back more to your question, uh, housing has al always kind of been a problem in Pinellas County. Uh, we are a peninsula on a peninsula. We're, we're pretty locked in and we're the most dense county in Florida. So it, it's been an issue for a number of years that was then exacerbated by the pandemic and larger forces that happened. And so we started going and talking to folks in community in early 2021 um, as a response to some of the policy that sprang out of the pandemic. Um, a lot of folks may not necessarily know that the same bill that passed the U.S. Congress that gave uh, most people a stimulus check also cut a check to a lot of municipal county and even state governments. Uh, I think Pinellas County got 189 million, St. Petersburg got a separate 45 million, and the state of Florida got like $10 billion in funds from that aid package. And so as organizers, we went out into the community just to one, educate folks, say, hey, did you know that St. Petersburg is getting $45 million from the federal government? And then second, to ask what, what, what use could that money be put to in, in your community? And we had a number of issues that we kind of came into it assuming that people would answer with. Housing was one of them, but it was definitely not our top choice. We had folks on public transportation. Gun violence was the angle that I first came uh, to that conversation with. And we were just kind of blown away by the number of people who said, we need some, we need some help with housing. Like we, we just can't afford to keep a roof over our head. Uh, rents keep going up and our wages aren't going up to keep pace with that. Not to mention the disruption in employment for a lot of folks that happened during the pandemic. Um, especially acutely felt here in Florida where we had policymakers who decided to cut off federal support early <laughs> for for no reason other than uh, this this false idea that if you put economic pressure on people, 
they will be forced to get themselves out of the situation. And really the only thing that ends up leading to is more poverty and more misery. So the funding that you speak of, and those are big numbers. Those are very big numbers. Uh, did, because that happened, I believe, in 2021, looking back through the, the uh, lens of uh, what did happen, was there significant effort to ameliorate the housing issues in Pinellas County? Yes, uh, definitely. Um, I think you're right in, in pointing out that while $45 million is a lot of money, it's also a drop in the bucket right. compared to the scale of the problem. Uh, because of our organizing efforts, uh, St. Petersburg ended up allocating 76% of that. So about 34 million of that 45 million specifically to housing affordability programs. And that was by far the highest in the state. So St. Petersburg definitely took it seriously. And we knew that even if all $45 million went to that, it was not going to solve homelessness or the housing crisis that we're seeing. One of the things that occurs to me from a local issue viewpoint is there seems always to be a tension when you have a very small amount of uh, available land because of the nature of, as you said, a peninsula in a peninsula, um, surrounded by water. There's no, there's no more land. So uh, there seems to always be an ongoing tension when some piece of land might be available uh, to discuss, well, what are we going to do about it? Where is that land going to be used? Who's going to... Who's going to have the uh, the benefit of that land? Um, I know that there were discussions, or have been ongoing discussions, uh, because I know that that uh, our area of Florida, Tampa, St. Petersburg, and all, is a uh, a very sports minded community, and lots of support for for whatever we have in terms of professional sports team, whether it's the the Bucks or the Rays or the Lightning or whoever it is, lots of support for that. And so the thing that that uh, seems to be a an issue out there out front right now is a I'll call it a tension, a com a competition between philosophies on how you uh, allocate a piece of land. Like the trop, I think, is. Uh, I guess at the focus of all this, if you get rid of it, if you do away with the trop, is that a 100% allocation to professional sports? Is that what you do with that very, what do you call it, precious piece of land that becomes available? Or are there other purposes that might... Uh, uh, address these social justice needs that we've talked about. And I know this is a very uh, hotly controversial, highly argued, I guess, uh, uh, I don't know how else to describe it. There doesn't seem to be any agreement on it at all. But one of the things that I'm wanting to inquire about is there seems to be a fair amount of talk about we're going to create affordable housing in Pinellas County or St. Petersburg or whatever political subdivision you're talking about. Seems to be a fair amount of talk about it. But from my perspective, trying to research into it, one of the reasons I've asked you here and others, trying to not just come up with my opinion but to find the facts, I ha I'm unable to see... I'm unable to define or quantify or get my hand handle around what has actually been done for affordable housing in Pinellas County. And by the way, Nick, what's the definition of affordable housing? I, I appreciate that question. Actually, that question is the most frequent question we get when talking to residents. It, it's kind of framed in a question and also a statement is what does affordable even mean? because the honest answer that it, it's a sliding scale and, and there are definitions 
based on essentially the average income of a place where technically anything lower than 80% of that level is considered affordable. You might see folks refer to it all the way up to 120% of the average though as well. Sometimes that's called workforce housing. Sometimes it's called affordable housing. And I think one of the most frustrating things for a resident who just needs a little help or someone who's like more steeped in the policy is the fact that affordable housing has really become this political buzzword that's more about winning votes than it is about actually helping people with housing. Um, here in St. Petersburg, for instance, I think that the the area median income is somewhere around $80,000. But even that fluctuates when you're talking about different family sizes. So I won't try to like quote the in, in, entire chart. But just looking at the scale of the need, um, HUD, the Housing and Urban Development, has some definitions of what being cost burdened for housing looks like. So they say that if you are paying more than 30% of your income on housing, you are cost burdened. If you're paying more than 50%, half of your income, you're what's known as severely burdened. And if you look at the numbers, the further down you go in income level, the higher the need is. So folks, I think making under about 50% of the average, those folks account for over 80% of the folks that are severely burdened. Okay, now wait a minute. Housing. I just heard some numbers and I, I want to <laughs> put this on the record because, because it's a it's actually kind of an astonishing number. I want to I want to repeat it, and then say, Nick, is that right? Because that people making less than half of the uh, average, which in Pinellas County is eighty thousand, so we're talking about forty thousand dollars. We're not varying it for family size or anything else. We're just picking a number, forty thousand dollars. 80% of the need for affordable housing falls within the category of folks making 40000 or less per year. Yes, and to simplify it, we that's also roughly about $20 an hour if you're working a full-time job. So with that, uh, and, and this may not be a question you can answer, and I may have to get it from someone else, but then as a factual matter, truth telling here as a factual matter is there any affordable housing in st petersburg there is some yes not not nearly enough and 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 that's that's kind of where the policy comes in and that's kind of where i was talking about this idea of affordable housing being talked about in in kind of a pr sense more than a, a policy and helping people sense one of the most there's two there's actually two very common myths that we hear about housing. The first is the myth of the missing middle. And it's this idea that middle income people are the ones that are suffering the most from cost of housing. And the data just does not bear that out. That's not to say that middle income people aren't struggling. Prices have gone up all over the board. But if you look at the data, the best thing we can do is get lower income people into housing they can afford because that is going to, those folks are currently occupying housing units that are priced for middle income people. And so if you move those folks into housing they can afford, you alleviate the pressure on folks in the middle income level as well. It's kind of a rising tide lifts all boats kind of situation. Yeah. And then probably one of the stickiest myths around about housing is this idea that it's just a simple supply and demand issue. That's what I've heard. I cringe every time I hear there's a housing shortage, there's a housing shortage. And I'll just use Florida for an example. These numbers are probably a little old right now because they're, they're from a couple years back, but there are approximately 30,000 unhoused people in Florida in any given year. 
and 1.6 million vacant homes across the state of Florida. And so we need to not just look about the pure number of homes, but who owns those homes and what are they doing with them? It's, you know, just to kind of wrap it up in a, in a neat little bow to, in a sense too. I think that while the issue is complex, I think we make it unnecessarily complex by all the systemic nature of it, of how we address housing is someone has to profit off of it. Yeah. And that, that seems to be the, uh, again, to those of you who are listening from other areas, it's my perception, my belief, uh, and, and actually my uh, statement here, that just because there are local circumstances here in St. Petersburg, like the peninsula and the peninsula and all that, limited land, uh, I've spent most of my life in Texas where there's a whole lot of land, whole lot of land, and yet the problem of unhoused people exists there too. So the notion that um, we have a shortage of supply, and this is a nationwide comment or a, also other places comment, that we have a inadequate supply of, of land or we have an inadequate supply of housing units, um, I think you said that's, you call that a myth. I think it, it is certainly a misconception, certainly a misconception. I've uh, uh, kind of tried to expand my research a little bit beyond Florida, although I wanted to talk about this this local issue because it has it has presented some hot spots, I guess you'll call it, the competition for the use of repurposed land and uh, different ideas about homeless people and and that translates and this is where I'm interested in, particularly in, in a comment from you because you're working in this field um, city councils city governments county governments local governments uh, they get presented with some kind of problem and it's usually for the for, presented to them by those who have access to them. Uh, I spent many years as a county attorney and others, and I know that that uh, the communication process is from folks who have access. So if your access, uh, the people who, you, who talk to you say, well, we need to solve this, quote, homeless problem, and they come to you with a, uh, uh, there's people sleeping in the park or there's, you know, these things are happening and it's disturbing the, the quiet enjoyment of our neighborhood. Whatever, I'm not trying to specify the particular argument that might get made. The government person, the elected official, is going to try to react to that. They're going to try to address it from the viewpoint of the person who has access to them. And from what I have studied myself, experienced myself, and what I've certainly heard from other speakers on this platform, that generally translates into status offenses. Uh, it's unlawful to sleep outside. And, you know, there's a great fallacy in that. If, if land is private, then presumably everybody can be excluded from it except whoever owns it. If land is public, then that land is available to the public. And if you suggest that someone can't sleep outside and they don't have any other place to sleep, just to oversimplify it from a legal viewpoint, you've simply made it unlawful to be. And I think that's what happens where the local public officials try very hard to answer the problem from the viewpoint of those who have access. Would you care to comment on that that stream of consciousness that, the, that I just put on the air? <laughs> I, I appreciate you bringing that up so much because I've increasingly seen the connection between our democracy 
and issues like housing and, and just economic issues in general is the whole system is set up to be able to hear from folks with more resources. And, you know, I want to be clear that I believe the vast majority of elected officials are not some malicious force. Um, well, I don't think so either. Collaborating on, on how they can do harm to poor people or anything like that. But it is important of who you spend your time with the most and who you receive your funding for to run for office. And it's, it's not as simple as some sort of quid pro quo of I'm going to give you this donation and you're going to do this. But when you set up your entire political system of I need to raise money to be successful in my political career, then that just leads to more and more conversations with the same type of people. And then the secondary aspect of that is just what you said about these types of like complaints from people who they see an immediate problem in front of them of there's this person who is clearly unwell, who is like in this space that I'm trying to enjoy. And what we need our elected officials to do is take leadership and say that if this is a nuisance to you, having an unhoused person in your space, in your public property, whatever it may be, well, then the solution is to get them housing. It's not to sweep them under the rug or bury them in fines and fees. That only exacerbates the problem. And, and so we just like, we get caught in this cycle of short-term thinking that never actually deals with the underlying problem and then we, we sit here and wonder what caused it and, and it's it's maddening at times there's a a case presently has been orally argued to the united states supreme court happens to involve a, a city in oregon right now but it could involve any any city anywhere because at issue is one of these status offense situations, which makes it jailable, actually, makes it a, a, uh, a criminal offense to be somewhere, <laughs> which I know sounds, if you're listening to this on the, on the air, sounds like an overstatement or a little bit ludicrous, but the fact is it's not. Uh, I think it's the city of Grants Pass, Oregon. But in any event, that's the, a case presently pending before the United States Supreme Court on this issue, on the issue of, of uh, do these laws really work? Do these laws, are they constitutional? Are they permissible? Can you actually exclude a human being from your community by saying that that person can't? sleep outside uh, and, and it uh, th this is honestly not a political statement this is a legal statement from an old Texas lawyer uh, and, and it is this you cannot legislate your way out of a out of a social justice problem and I think that's true whether you're talking about abortion, whether you're talking about uh, uh, just about anything, legislating your way out of it, particularly, uh, as we just discussed, approaching it from the viewpoint of people who have access to you, uh, rarely, rarely solves the problem. Um, housing, I don't purport to know. I honestly don't how uh, localities like Grants Pass, Oregon, or uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, are going to put together a uh, sustainable solution to a housing problem. I don't know. I don't know the answer. So it's probably not fair for me to criticize those who are in the position of having to make the decision, and yet I wonder and maybe you have a perspective on this, if enough priorities being given to try and figure out what we're going to do about it. 
from our elected officials? Probably not. <laughs> but but I think I think what's so important, and this is this is true of so many different issues. Like it's true of gun violence. It's true of housing. It's true of immigration. A lot of the times, people just throw up their hands and say, "This is so complex. I don't know what to do about it." When there's a lot of research out there of of what we can do about it, and so on an issue like housing what we've really been pushing for and proposing is an option outside of the market for housing and so what that looks like is a city or a county a state you know whatever producing housing that is more for residents need than it is to make a profit now don't get me wrong the city can draw revenue off of this type of housing and use it to fund future projects. But when you remove the need to have some sort of profit margin, you can do a whole lot more because the problem with the market is that the market is amoral in the sense that there is no difference in the market. If you're just looking at pure market forces, there's no difference between an apartment and an Xbox. And it's a big problem when you say something is worth whatever people are willing to pay for it because people are willing to pay whatever it takes to get into housing. They are not willing to pay whatever it takes to get an Xbox. And so just having options, a public option for housing, if you will, or social housing is another way in which it's framed is housing that is widely available across income levels for people to access but it's publicly developed and it's publicly managed um so, so public housing projects um and i can already hear the echoes from uh, from those who remember the hud projects of the 1970s and things like that um uh, saying that public housing uh at least in the model that it was in at that time was a failure but here's a couple of observations, and they may be nothing more than that, but I'll, I'll hazard to do, to do it. One of them is I notice when cities get larger and when there is crowding and when there is a limitation of available land, the amount of square footage allocated to a living unit goes down. And this, this includes... Uh, one St. Pete and all the other downtown vertical developments here in St. Pete or Dallas or or uh, Fort Worth or the places I know a lot about. So people will adjust to what's needed. If, if and and my thought is using New York City. I hardly ever use New York City as an example of anything, but but let's use it for an example right now. Um, in New York City and Tokyo and London, if a person has a living unit with 600 square feet, they consider that an adequate living unit. If the notion of public housing is that across income levels you can match available housing to ability to pay, and, and as you said, maybe take the profit and margin out of that, um, there might be a sustainable solution, even where land and places to put them are uh, limited. Yeah, and it's it's going to look different in different areas. You know that that kind of density argument kind of goes back to the supply and demand. Is uh, density does not always equal affordable housing. If that were the case, places like New York City and Tokyo would be the cheapest in the world, and in, instead they're the most expensive. And so um, the idea of this is it's going to look different in different places, but in Pinellas County or St. Pete, where we're already pretty built out, that might mean that as opposed to developing new housing with public funds, it's acquiring existing housing with public funds or acquiring unused commercial space and converting it into housing with public funds. And just... Um, That's an interesting point because I have noticed 
despite the crowding of land, the unavailability of land and so forth, there is a fair amount, you can see it from the street, a fair amount of unoccupied commercial space, even right here in St. Petersburg. Same thing applies in Dallas, Fort Worth, Lubbock, El Paso. It, it's same thing. And you wonder uh, what prevents the conversion of that kind of commercial space, that kind of unused, and in fact, burdensome because somebody's paying a tax bill on that unused commercial space. So what uh, it makes one wonder, uh, and I guess that's as far as I've gotten is to wonder, it makes one wonder what what is the barrier to the conversion? Well, this is where the big scary R word of racism pops in and zoning laws, honestly, is, is what makes it really difficult. Um, in, in some ways, it's, it's beneficial in the sense of you, you don't want someone living next to a big polluting factory or something like that. But so often it's been wielded um, in a racist manner uh, that keeps black and brown populations impoverished and in certain areas. And, and I, I think that's like this also points to the history of public housing of where it failed is one, this idea of we're going to make it extremely limited to only the poorest of the poor, and we're going to predominantly put it in black and brown neighborhoods. Minority neighborhoods. And, we're, fact, not gonna, and we're not going to fund it. <laughs> and, and, in fact, I think a big criticism, because I am old and I remember a lot of this, I think one of the big current criticisms back in, in that day and time was that a lot of uh, existing housing was flattened, was, was torn down with HUD money with the notion that now we need to put uh, uh, this affordable housing in there. So what I'd like to wind up with is this. The why is probably too complex for us to sit here on No Hate Radio and address. The the what are we going to do about it? One of the things I took from your comments is there are answers. We just have to be willing to take them. We have to be willing to accept those answers and act on those answers. And I don't know whether uh, uh, I don't know whether we have the the public will to do that or not, but it appears to me that that's the uh, uh, at least the uh, avenue that is going to have to to be followed to some extent because two things are apparent to me: one. I don't see how it is sustainable, and I'm very curious as to how the U.S. Supreme Court will rule on the Grants Pass Oregon case because I don't think it is sustainable to make it unlawful to be. I, I think that's a very tenuous and very shaky position for us as a country, as a nation, as a state, whatever. And also... Income disparity being what it is uh, shows no signs of mitigating. And if that's the case, and incomes are not, well, they also show no signs of matching the increase in costs and so forth for a lot of economic power, a lot of economic reasons. It seems that we're going to have to, as a society, come up with that sustainable solution, not the one that we talk about in political speeches, not the one that we, that we tell people, uh, for example, and I guess I've got to give a disclaimer here real quick. I'm an aviator. I like quitted field. I don't want anybody messing with it. But, but one thing I've heard is, okay, let's just level the, the downtown airport. Let's just level that. And we're going to put affordable housing there. To me, number one, it's seven feet above sea level. <laughs> but, but the number two thing is, 
if we're driven by market forces and if we're driven by uh, the people that have the ability to purchase and develop and build, and if that's who's going to be expected to build the housing on this flattened airport, where it is with water surrounding it all around the high rises in downtown St. Petersburg, it's not going to be affordable housing. So comment that I'd like to wind up on is, I don't think that's real. I don't think, I don't, I don't think at this point I'm going to venture out to say it doesn't appear, at least at local level, at least in St. Petersburg, Florida, that serious consideration is being given to the sustainable part of housing solution. Any comments about that, Nick, as we wrap up? Yeah, so I think that the current way we're operating isn't sustainable. And, you know, I'll, I'll circle back to earlier in the conversation and, and this is really what has opened my eyes a little bit to the, the unsustainable nature is we don't ask those same questions about sustainability when it's offering over $400 million to a baseball team to build a new baseball stadium. And, and granted, people <laughs> like me and you are asking those questions <laughs> about sustainability, but... Um, I think that there's a way what that's taught me is that there is enough to go around and it's really about changing the political will uh, to make it happen. And, you know, this may be an unsatisfying answer for some, but it's, it's organizing and democracy and, and to really distill it down, it's going and talking to your neighbor <laughs> about that's, these types of issues. Well, that uh, that used to work before social media, Nick. <laughs> uh, Maybe I'm a hopeless optimist. <laughs> well, thanks to everyone for listening today and to Nick Carey uh, for his insight and vision that he's provided us today. From his place, which is not to use a, a tired phrase, but his position where there's boots on the ground in this type of, of uh, issue and, and an effort to try and do something about it. I like to wind up with this. No Hey Radio has a website. Uh, it's simply easy to find, nohayradio.com. And uh, it'll come up and you can learn about, uh, you, you, you can learn about the two of us who, who run and operate this thing, myself and Cameron Helwig. And uh, you can learn about what we're trying to do in writing. We've mentioned some of it on the air. We have a phone number. 4424 no hate which you can call in leave us a message if you have an idea for some subject you would like to see us delve into something you'd like to see us talk about or if you have uh, uh, kudos or criticisms whatever it is we want to encourage people to uh, be a part of the dialogue that we're trying to do and and please understand we're trying to raise the level of dialogue. We're trying to increase the quality of dialogue. And the only thing that is excluded on this forum, this podcast, is right in the name, no hate. We don't do hate. We do everything else. With that, thanks to everybody for participating, for listening. I hope that uh, Nick has given you some things to think about from your perspective, wherever you are in this great United States. And we'll wrap it up this way as I usually do. This is No Hate Radio. <laughs>